Thank you very much. And uh, so this is joint work with Marcello Mamino, who is in Pisa. And uh, uh, let me just start by illustrating the problem of, of Skolem. So Skolem consider the following set of, scholem, of functions. So it's the smallest class of functions containing the constant function one, the identity function x, and closed under addition, multiplication, and exponentiation. So if f and g are uh, scolem functions, so is f plus g, f times g, f to the g. So for instance, this one there is a scolem function. So some kind of uh, iterated uh, exp exponential polynomial. Notice that I didn't put subtraction in the in the language, um, and uh, because subtraction would have caused problems because uh, then you cannot take um, you know minus uh, something to something else. Um, I could have allowed a limited form of subtraction, but then uh, I didn't. So the first question that one could ask is whether there is some kind of normal form for this kind of expressions, like uh, for- uh, Excuse me, Alessandro, just to, to get started. We, we should think of these as functions from where to where, or just oh, as, sorry, as, sorry. as from, expressions? From, from positive reals to positive reals. Okay, so that's the reason why minus won't be good, okay, because right. we're bounded right. to positive reals, okay. Right, right, right. Uh, and, and actually, actually, you could also consider them from uh, positive integers to positive integers. It's, uh, it, it doesn't matter. So either from positive reals to positive reals or positive integers to positive integers. One determines the other. And of course, you, you would like to find some kind of normal form um, by applying the usual rules for uh, addition, multiplication, the laws of uh, exponentiation. So using the, the usual rules, you can put it in, 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 in this normal form, but which is not unique, however. So you can make it into a sum of uh, terms, and each term is either uh, x, to the, some, x to some power or an exponential term. And then the exponential term is again inductively of the same form, both the exponent and the base. So the, the, the normal form is not unique, even up to the rules. So in fact, uh, Wilkie uh, observed that the rules are not sufficient to prove all the valid identities on, uh, he, he was not considering scolem functions, but his result applies in particular to scolem functions. So in particular, you have, uh, this is a valid identity considered by Wilkie, where x, uh, where a, b, c, d are defined below, but cannot be proved using the rules. And the reason is that to prove some identities, you implicitly need to use some kind of subtraction, for instance, to factorize the polynomial b, but you don't have a, a subtraction in the language. Um, Anyway, the problem now arises how to prove that two such expressions are equal uh, since you don't have a, a normal form. So the, the, the first problem is the identity problem. Uh, well, one observation that you can uh, immediately do is that if you take two scolem functions, the difference has finitely many zeros. Actually, this can be seen as a special case of the minimality of uh, R exp, the reals with the exponential function, no? because uh, actually every definable set using plus times exponentiation over the reals has finitely many connected components. This is the famous minimality result of Wilkie. Now, to solve the identity problem, you actually need uh, an effective version of this result. Namely, you want to give an upper bound, a computable upper bound on the number of zeros. And this can actually be done. And so this is uh, by, by Richardson. So you can compute n such that f minus g has at most n zeros. 
Also, this is a special case of the effective or minimality of R exp. So, although you don't know whether the theory of R exp is decidable, you can prove some effective uh, uh, bounds. For instance, so you can prove that every definable set has uh, computably, you can compute an upper bound on the number of connected components, in particular the number of zeros. So, it, it, it immediately follows, although you don't have a normal form that the equality of scoring functions is decidable because you just compute f and g on uh, n plus one uh, uh, integer values and, uh, and if they are equal, uh, the functions are identity equal. Uh, notice that uh, although you can compute an upper bound on the number of zeros, you cannot compute, at least it's not known, how to compute an upper bound on the size of the of the zeros on the size of the largest zero and this is again connected with the open problem whether the theory of r exp is decidable or not but the equality at least is decidable the equality of scoring function more difficult is to decide the order so you can order, of course, the scolem functions by saying that uh, one is bigger than another if uh, f of x is less than g of x for all sufficiently large x's inputs. And uh, this is, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, x plus 1 to the x is easily seen to be less than x to the x plus 1. Um, you get a total order. Again, the total the totality is again by your minimality, if you want, because uh, f minus g can have finitely many zeros, so can change sign only finitely many times. So, at some point on, uh, from some point on, uh, you get uh, a definite or, uh, an order. So you get a total order, and uh, you can observe that every scolem function is bounded by some iterated power, a tower of uh, exponential functions. And more interesting is the fact that it's a well order. So this is a well order. There are no infinite descending chains of scolem functions. Of course, uh, it's important here not to have subtraction in the language. So for instance, if you start with x to the x plus 1 and you want to try to find a decreasing sequence, you may try with the sequence that I just displayed. But sooner or later, you must reach one. You cannot decrease forever. Of course, you can make the sequence as long as you want, starting from x uh, to the x plus one, but uh, at, at some point you reach one and you stop. So the natural, then there are two natural questions now, which are both open. Is the order decidable? So given f and g, can you decide if f is less than g? And then the second problem is what's the order type? So it's a well order, so the order type must be an ordinal. And, and what is it? It must be a countable ordinal. And uh, incredibly, both uh, are open. And in particular, the first one is uh, striking because it looks like a uh, you know, high school problem to decide the order, but uh, it's, it's still an open question. And it's a, a particular case also of the open, big open problem of the decidability of the reals with exponentiation. Regarding the order type, we will see that there is a, the conjecture of a scholem is that the order type is epsilon zero. But let's, uh, let's, uh, let's first deal with the first problem, the decidability of the order. Well, the order is actually decidable under a conditional hypothesis, uh, which is a conditional conjecture, which is uh, uh, Shannon's conjecture. Because under Shannon's conjecture, the whole theory of R exp is decidable. So in particular, the order, because it's one of the questions you can ask uh, inside the theory. And Shannon's conjecture is a famous conjecture in transcendental number theory, which says that if you have n complex numbers linearly independent over Q, the transcendence degree of the extension by these numbers, Z1, Z1, Zn, and their exponentials is at least n. So uh, if you assume Shannon's conjecture, everything is decidable. And uh, you cannot really do better than this. Uh, Shannon's conjecture is considered out, of, considered out of reach. So you don't 
but we don't want to assume Schoenel's conjecture. So this is regarding the first problem that I mentioned, the order, the desirability of the order. Regarding the order type, Schoenel's conjecture is not going to help very much because if Schoenel's conjecture fails, the order type can only become uh, smaller because Schoenel's conjecture says that uh, there are as less identities or as less relations as possible. So under Schoenel's conjecture, it could be that, uh, you know, you get some identifications, but if you want an upper bound on the order type, Schoenel's conjecture is not going to help. So one can observe that the order type is at least epsilon zero. Epsilon, this is was ob already observed by Skolem, and this is why he conjectured that it was indeed epsilon zero. It's at least epsilon zero, which is the, of course, least fixed point of the map sending the ordinal uh, x to omega to the x. So it's the soup of omega, omega to the omega. Notice that we are speaking about omega to the omega in the sense of ordinal exponentiation, not cardinal exponentiation. So it's uh, all these are countable ordinals. And uh, uh, why it's at least like epsilon zero? Because you can, uh, it's easy to prove because you take an ordinal less than epsilon zero, you write it in Cantor's normal form, Cantor's normal form, you replace every occurrence of omega in the Cantor normal form with x, and you get a scolem function. And this gives an order preserving embedding from epsilon zero to the scolem functions. So the order type is at least epsilon zero. Of course, um, uh, what I want to say, uh, it's not surjective on the scolem functions because you are never going to get x plus one to the x, right? The, the only base uh, is x in the exponentiation. Okay, so uh, just to, if you restrict this map to the polynomials, I mean, the same argument shows that the order type of the polynomials with positive integer coefficients is omega to the omega, no? Because if you consider the example that I've put above, if you just consider the polynomial part, 3x5 plus x square, you get uh, omega to the 5 times 3 plus omega square, you get something less than omega to the omega. And on, in this case, you get a bijection. Okay, Skolem conjecture that the order type is indeed epsilon zero, and I'm not going to solve the Skolem problem, I'm just going to do a very tiny little progress, but uh, the point of my talk is just to show that the surreal numbers can in principle be used to tackle such problems. So it's an illustration of the method more than the result itself that I'm going to, to, to explain. Um, well, sorry, Alessandro, I didn't get why the, the map you described here is not subjective. What kind of because uh, if you, you you never get x plus one to the x x plus one in parentheses everything to the x. Mm -hmm. okay. But but this okay this is this is clear enough this example. So the idea of substituting x with omega doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm because uh, uh, x plus one to the x is bigger than x to the x as a scolem function, but as an ordinal is equal if you substitute omega mm -hmm. with x with omega, right? And this is uh, ordinal exponentiation mm -hmm. again. So it works well on uh, a fragment of, uh, the, of epsilon of the scolem function, the fragment corresponding to the, to the Cantor normal form of the ordinals, but doesn't work well in general. So, but in any case, it's at least epsilon zero, and uh, one could conjecture that it is epsilon zero, and indeed, uh, this, uh, it, uh, it's a natural conjecture. Um, okay, well, uh, this problem uh, that I just said, that x plus one to the x is bigger than x to the x, but omega plus one to the omega is equal to the omega to the omega, depends on the fact that we are trying to make these computations in the ordinals. Ordinal exponentiation doesn't work, doesn't work 
doesn't have similar properties as real exponentiation, but also addition doesn't have the same good properties. Ordinal addition is, is non-commutative. A real addition is commutative. So the point is that you should make these substitutions not in the ordinals, but in the surreal numbers, because in the surreal numbers, we will see that you still have, uh, the surreal numbers contain the ordinals, but they contain the, and they have uh, a notion of exponentiation, uh, sum and product. So in the surreal numbers, this problem will not arise. So this in the surreal numbers, omega plus one to the omega computed in the surreal numbers is bigger than omega to the omega as it should reflecting the real situation. Okay, now uh, let me mention that uh, there, there have been various uh, attempts to solve a uh, scholar problem. There are some very huge bounds on the order type, but uh, like uh, the first um, predicative ordinal, very, very big, uh, gamma zero for people that know this uh, big ordinal, so, or even larger than that. But uh, uh, below 2 to the 2 to the x, there are better results. So below 2 to the 2 to the x, Van den Dries and Levitz showed that uh, the order type of the scoring functions less than 2 to the 2 to the x has order type omega to the omega to the omega. Well, this is a consequence of uh, another result which involves asymptotic analysis. This is the reason why my talk is entitled asymptotic analysis. So you want to compute some limits. So the theorem, the main theorem of Van den Dries and Levitz is the following. That if you fix, if, if you want to compute the limit for x tending to infinity of f divided by g, where f and g are scoring functions, suppose you take two scoring functions which are comparable, namely they are in the same Archimedean class. That means that each of them is bounded by an integer multiple of the other. So, you, 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 so for instance, uh, x and 2x, right? So if, you, if f and g are in the same uh, uh, Archimedean class, the limit will exist by your minimality if you want. If you fix the denominator and you let f vary in the same Archimedean class, but always below 2 to the 2 to the x, you are going to get a discrete subset of R. Discrete, I mean closed and discrete. So necessarily has order type omega cannot be bigger than omega, no? If it were omega to the omega, omega plus omega, it would have an accumulation point. So in some sense, this says, this says that in each Archimedean class, in the Archimedean class of G, there are only omega scolem functions below two to the two to the X. So at least uh, if you divide the scoring functions in Archimedean classes. In each Archimedean class, you know that there are only omega things. But this works below 2 to the 2 to the x. No, it doesn't, uh, the, the result doesn't extend in general. I mean, actually, the, the result of Van Andries and Levitz doesn't extend in general, but we are going to prove that it's exactly the same theorem in general. So this precise theorem we are going to extend it to the whole class of scolem functions. So uh, let me mention also another theorem of Gurevich, which also works only below 2 to the 2 to the x. So you can decide the order two to, below 2 to the 2 to the x. You can decide the order, provided you can decide the equality of exponential constants. Exponential constants are just the smallest class, the smallest set of reals containing one and closed under plus times inverse and exp. And then you take the difference of two of those. These are the exponential constants. So you get, if you have two exponential terms, it may not be easy to see which one is, if they are equal or not. It may depend on uh, uh, Shannon's conjecture, it's complicated. So for instance, it could be that e to the e is equal to 17 over 31, but you, know, you, you don't know, right? Uh, 
Anyway, if you could, but the problem is at least reducible to exponential constants. If you know exponential constants, then you can decide the order, but again, only below two to the, two to the x. So the, 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 the good results are below two to the two to the x. Why? What's so special about two to the two to the x? Well, what is special is that you the fragment below 2 to the 2 to the x actually can be as a nice characterization, syntactic characterization. It just means that you only allow the exponent x in the formation of scholem function. You don't allow, for instance, f to the power 2 to the x. You only allow f to x. But then, of course, it's still complicated because you can take, uh, you know, x plus 1 to the x plus x and everything to the x again, and, and plus another expression of that kind, and the same thing to the x. But anyway, you are, it, it's much simpler. Now, the technique used by Van den Dries and Levitz to prove the result essentially is a complicated induction, but the, the crucial step of the induction step is the following. So you would like to compute the limits of f over g. To compute the limits, you need to prove a stronger result. And you want to compute the Loran expansion. Loran expansion, you, you know what Loran expansion means. So, so you, instead of Taylor expansion, in which you have only powers of x, x to the n, in Loran expansion, you also have uh, negative powers, right? like like uh, x plus 5 plus 1 over x plus and so and so. So you have positive and negative powers of x. Uh, so you would like to compute the Loran expansion of, uh, say, uh, if you know the Loran expansion of a certain quotient, f divided by g, could be infinite or zero, but suppose if, if they are in the same Archimedean class, it would start with a real number and uh, it could be five plus one over x plus two over x squared, something like that. So suppose you know the one of f over g, you want to compute the one of f to the h divided by g over h. This can be done below in the fragment, but not in general. And the reason is very simple. Consider these three functions, 2 to the x plus 1, 2 to the x, and the exponent 2 to the x. If you do f divided by g, this is just uh, 1 plus 1 over 2 to the x. So if you try to compute the Loran expansion, you just get 1, because the polynomial part is just 1, and then there is an exponentially small term. So you are going to lose completely information coming, or it's a, it's a very simple case, and the Loran expansion is just the constant term. In general, you may have, uh, you know, a Loran uh, series plus 1 over 2 to the x, say. But in any case, these exponentially small terms are completely invisible in the Loran expansion. So they will certainly will not determine, they will not help if you want to compute the Loran expansion of uh, the same thing raised to the 2 to the x. So if you raise everything to the 2 to the x, you get e plus some other terms. So the Loran part is just e. So you are, of course, you cannot recover e only just by knowing 1. You know, you go from 1 to e. And this is the problem. So. This problem arises because we are no longer in the special fragment, because f to the 2 to the g is no longer in the fragment below 2 to the 2 to the x. This kind of problems cannot happen in the fragment, can only happen outside of the fragment. Outside of the fragment, some exponentially small terms, which come after the Loran expansion, could play a significant role. So you need to take them into account. Okay, so the idea is to replace Loran expansions with uh, surreal expansions, that's it, which are more complicated uh, kind of series. 
which also can take into account these exponentially small terms. So I need to tell you what are those real numbers. So this is a one slide uh, course on surreal numbers. So the surreal numbers are the nodes of a transfinite binary tree. So in, in, any, in other words, a surreal number is a function from an ordinal to a binary set, or to an ordinal to zero one or plus minus. And of course you can depict the surreal numbers as nodes of a transfinite binary tree. And uh, I, I put some labels here. Zero is the root. Then you have minus one, one, minus two, minus, minus one half. So you, uh, of course, uh, start to suspect that there is some uh, uh, definition of addition and multiplication somewhere. And then I'm going to explain how it is. So first of all, you have a tree-like structure, which gives you a notion of simplicity. So it's a well-founded relation, this uh, tree-like structure. So you say that x is simpler than y if, if, if uh, y is a descendant of x in the tree. So in other words, x is above y. So 0 is the simplest element of everything. Then come uh, 1 and minus 1, then uh, one, 1 over 2 is one is simpler than one over two, zero is simpler than one, one is simpler than one over two, and, and so on. So. so this is a simplicity relation, which is uh, the tree, the, the, the tree ordering, and it's well founded. But you also have another partial, another total order. You have a total order, which simply means you read the, the, the tree from left to right. So x is left is less than any right descendant of x. So right descendant means a descendant of the right children. So for instance, one half is bigger than zero because one half is the sum of one and one is on the right of zero, right? So all the descendants of one, the descendants, all the descendants of one are bigger than zero. All the descendants of minus one are less than zero. And so, and similarly, you define the left descendants are less than zero. So you have a total order and a partial order, total order. Now, everything is done by induction on the tree-like ordering. So given two sets of surreals. A and B with every element of A less than every element of B, there is a unique surreal X in between. Of course, A and B cannot be complementary because their surreals form a proper class and A and B are sets. So uh, there is always something in between and there is a, a unique X in between, which is the simplest element. And you denote it by this notation A bar B. And now you can define addition and multiplication. Addition x plus y is something between the so-called left options and the right options. What are the left options? X with some big, they are defined here. XL is just a generic element simpler than x and less than x. And XR is a generic element bigger than x and simpler than x. So in some sense, you may, uh, you, you may say that you have inductively already defined the options of x and uh, of needed to define x plus y, and you define x plus y as the simplest element between the correct options. So you have partially defined the addition and you essentially, it means, that the addition is the simplest function, which is strictly increasing in both arguments. Multiplication, you do something very similar, but the formula is a bit more complicated because you also need to take into account the fact that you want multiplication to be, uh, addition to be distributive over multiplication. So you also need to to uh, impose the uh, distributivity laws. 
But anyway, if you do that, it doesn't matter if you understand these formulas at this point. If you do that, you get a real closed field containing the reals and containing also the ordinals. No, you have all the reals. The reals appear on the, on the finite levels. You have the dyadic rationals at level omega. If you look carefully in the picture that I draw, you have somewhere uh, all the real numbers, square root of two pi. And you also have some uh, new other numbers. For instance, omega itself, the ordinal omega itself is at level omega. And one over omega is also at level omega. And also one minus one over omega, you have uh, reals and infinite and infinitesimal elements at level omega, and then you can go on. So you have the ordinals and the reals. The ordinals on the right branch, but it's a real closed field. Real closed means, means that at this point, you can con compute, you can define omega minus one. It's a new number, doesn't exist in the ordinals. You can also compute the square root of omega. So it's another nice number. And actually, we will see that we can also compute the logarithm of omega and also exp of omega. Lots of things. It's a very rich structure. OK, now to go uh, further, you, must def you want to now uh, represent the surreals as a kind of generalized series. You want to show that the surreals contain the Loran series, contain the Taylor series in Omega, the, 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 the Loran series, the Puise series. They are kind of generalized series. To do that, you must first decide, decide what are the monomials. The monomials are the simplest elements in their own Archimedean class, the simplest positive elements in their Archimedean class. So for instance, you can show that uh, omega is a, a monomial, one over omega is a monomial, one is a monomial, omega to the n is a monomial. But of course, uh, two omega, two times omega is not a monomial because it's in the same Archimedean class as omega, but it's more complicated, right? So omega is simpler than two times omega, or omega is simpler than omega plus one. So omega is a monomial, omega plus one is not. We will see that also exp of omega is a monomial once we have defined exp. Now it turns out that every non-zero surreal can be written uniquely as a real number times a monomial plus something much smaller, small o of m, no, something which is smaller than any rational fraction of the of the previous one. So. Uh, R is a real, but it's also surreal, so everything lives inside the surreals. Now, so you get this is the first order expansion of X. So Rm is the first term of the expansion as a series. Now you apply inductively the same procedure to the remainder part, little o of m, and you get that every surreal ad admits a unique expansion as an infinite formal sum. Well, how do you define the sum? You, you, you simply keep going. At the successor stage, it's obvious what you need to do, no? because uh, you, you expand the, 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 the remainder if it's non-zero. At limit stages, if alpha, alpha is the index, at limit stages, you, uh, you have some choices. So it's, it's a pseudo limit for those who know some valuation theory. It's a pseudo limit of the partial previous sums. And which pseudo limit you want to take? The simplest one. Since you have a, a tree like simplicity relation, in some sense, you have a kind of definable choice. You, you never need the axiom of choice. You can define everything explicitly because you also are in a position to choose the simplest element satisfying your requirements. So you can define this. And it turns out that uh, every surreal number can be uniquely expanded as a formal sum indexed by an ordinal of real numbers times monomials. Now, uh, these monomials can be infinite or infinitesimals, the monomials appearing in the support. If they are all infinite, 
which means bigger than one, you say that the surreal is purely infinite. For instance, if you have uh, omega square plus three plus one over, omi one over omega, one over omega is infinitesimal, five is the constant part, omega square is purely infinite. So you, you, you have uh, a purely infinite uh, part, which may be present or not, followed by a constant part, followed by an infinitesimal tail. So the important thing is that in this series, the monomials must decrease. The tail must always be smaller and, than the, the head. Otherwise, will not will not be as asymptotic expansion. OK, now let's call uh, S the serial numbers. I apologize with the people knowing the serial numbers that usually they are called the NO. But uh, I, I didn't do it, this on purpose. It's just uh, by cut and paste by the various slides. So, uh, so now we know that it's uh, a field, contains the reals, contains the ordinals, in particular contains the ordinal omega. You can decompose it uh, in uh, a purely infinite part gamma plus a constant part uh, plus an infinitesimal part. So there is an exponentiation. There is an exponentiation sending x to the e to the x. And this exponentiation is a very good exponentiation. It has all the properties of the real exponentiation. So it's a model of Tx. Tx is the theory of the real exponential field, the first order theory of the real exponential field. So everything which is true in the reals is true in the surreals. For instance, e to the x plus y is e to the x times e to the y. And all, all possible properties that you can imagine are true for this exponentiation. And there is also a logarithm, which is the inverse of the exp on, defined on the positive part. Now, it, it, the, the nice fact is that the monomials are exactly the image of the exponential maps restricted to the purely infinite part. Of course, the exponential map is surjective on the positive part. So it doesn't take the image of the exponential part is the whole positive part, not only the monomials. But if you restrict it to the purely infinite part, you get exactly the monomials. So then this gives you a lot of monomials. For instance, uh, omega, e to the omega, e to the e to the omega, because omega is purely infinite. So e to the omega is a monomial. Then e to the e to the omega is another monomial. Also, omega plus omega square, omega square plus omega is purely infinite. So e to the omega square plus, time plus omega is another monomial. So also, also the logs are monomials. So now, essentially, now it, it means that you right. already. Okay. Yes. Can you say again what is purely infinite? Purely infinite means that if you write it as a series of uh, real. Every, every element can be written as a series of terms, and each term is a real number times a monomial. Purely infinite mm -hmm. means that all the monomials are bigger than one. All the monomials in the support are bigger than one. OK. For instance, if you have uh, uh, omega square plus omega is purely infinite. Omega square plus omega plus five plus one over omega is not purely infinite, right? So um, purely infinite is just the big part, the big part. It's a complement as a vector space, a real vector space. It's a complement of the finite elements. The finite elements are the reals plus the infinitesimals. The purely infinite are the complement of the infinite of the finite elements. Um, of course, it's not the unique. So, so you can define the purely elements, uh, the purely infinite, just using the um, the notion of uh, order. No, because uh, in a vector space you have uh, yes, given a okay, subspace, okay. you have several complements. This is a particular complement which is induced by the choice of uh, the monomials. But the monomials mm -hmm. are uh, canonically, there is no arbitrary choice. Everything is very explicit in the surreals. Mm -hmm. there, no, there are no arbitrary choices. Everything can be com 
you know, ex explicitly written and explicitly computable, so to speak. So it's a complement of the finite part. But if you have, if you have an infinite element plus a finite element, it's not long. It's still infinite, but it's not purely infinite. So it's a sum of infinite monomials. Okay. okay so you get, uh, uh, in some sense, so now, now we know that every cell real can be written. So this is a you can think of it as a generalization of uh, the representation of the reals in base ten. You know, every real can be written as in exponential notation in base ten. And this is also a representation in exponential notation. Every surreal can be written as a sum of reals times exponential terms of the form e to the gamma, where gamma is purely infinite. And this representation is unique. And in this representation, the purely infinite elements are those such that the gammas are bigger than zero because the gammas are already purely infinite. If they are bigger than zero, they are purely infinite bigger than zero, because also minus omega is purely infinite, but it's not positive, right? Okay, now you can start, uh, uh, this is just an example, for instance, you can start do try, you can start some computations. Exp of uh, uh, one- Let me yeah. ask another question. Why, why alpha is necessarily smaller than omega, omega one uh, in this case? Uh, no, left... yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is, this is uh, wrong, uh, sorry, because uh, this ah, okay. uh, cut and paste. In okay. principle, alpha is just an arbitrary ordinal. Okay. But in my original slide, uh, since uh, I spoke to people who didn't like uh, uh, proper classes, I, def I redefine the serial numbers saying that, uh, that S are the serial numbers uh, of countable length in the binary okay. tree. So up to level omega one, essentially. Right, so those right. Before the, so the if level. you okay. stop the construction of serial numbers at uh, below, you, so you only, you, only, you only truncate the binary tree at level omega one, yeah. then, uh, then alpha, of course, is less than omega one and everything is a set and not a proper class, but everything works perfectly well. Okay, mm -hmm. sorry, this uh, alpha is just an ordinal. Okay, now, exp of uh, one over omega, you can be computed uh, using just the Taylor series. So it's a sum omega to the minus n uh, over n factorial. Exp of omega is not given by the Taylor series because this series that I wrote there and I crossed in red, it is not, doesn't really work because in any series, the terms, the monomials appearing in a series must decrease. Instead, the, if you do sum of omega to the n, you get an increasing sequence of monomials. It's not a legitimate, it's not a legitimate series, right? So omega plus uh, one over omega plus one over omega square is legitimate. Omega plus omega square plus omega to the three and so on is not legitimate. So how do you compute x to the omega? Well, you don't need to compute it because it's already a monomial. It's already in normal form. X of one over omega is not a monomial and can be expanded in normal form. Same for log. So log of one plus an infinitesimal is given by the Taylor series. F to the G can be computed by the usual formula, E to the G log F. And so you have all the ingredients to embed the scolem functions. So now, if you have a scolem function fx, f of x, you can just compute it at x equal omega inside the serial numbers, makes perfect sense. So an f of omega, you can then expand it in normal form. It's an infinitary normal form. Remember, we had, we had some kind of difficulties in writing the scolem functions in finitary normal form. But if you allow infinitary normal forms, you, you have a perfectly good infinitary normal form of a scolem function. You just compute it in omega and you expand it in the series. So you call this the surreal expansion. 
in some cases, this can, uh, you know, help to decide if uh, f is less than g. For instance, suppose you want to show that x plus 1 to the x is less than x to the x plus 1. You just compute, uh, you just put x equal omega. You make the computations in the surreal numbers. And you find out, find out that uh, omega to the omega plus 1 obviously is omega times omega to the omega. On the other hand, omega plus 1 to the omega is e times omega to the omega plus some other terms. Since e is smaller than omega, the first one is smaller than the other. Of course, so you may do this even without knowing the surreal numbers. It's just an asymptotic expansion. If you put uh, x instead of omega, you could do more or less the same. But the kind of series that you obtain are not Taylor series, are not Laurent series, are not Puiset series. They are surreal series, or if you want, in this particular case, there are so-called trans series. We will see that trans series are also an important uh, class of uh, an important object. Uh, they have been uh, studied by many people, uh, Dan and Goering, uh, and also uh, Ekal, and then Van den Dries, Aschenbrenner, and Van der Oven. Uh, they are very, a very important tool. In, uh, in particular, Ekal used uh, this kind of series to solve uh, part of Hilbert's 16th problem, namely that the so-called Dulac conjecture, Dulac, Dulac problem. The Dulac problem says that uh, given uh, a polynomial planar vector field, it has finitely many limit cycles. And so to prove this, one has to analyze the so-called uh, Poincaré's retard map and expand this Poincaré retard map uh, in trans series and get some information. And, and this way, they uh, can prove the, this big result. So it, they are kind of generalized series, very, very interesting. But they are contained in the surreals. The surreals are even bigger, are contain many more things. OK, now, uh, now we can start to uh, go back to the theorem of Van den Dries and uh, Levitz. So we have two functions, f and g, scalene functions. You want to compute the limit for x going to infinity. So uh, one way to compute this limit is Substitute x with omega, do the computations in the surreals, expand f of omega divided by g over omega into a series, an infinite series. If it has a constant term, that means the, co the, the coefficient of the monomial 1 is the constant term. If f and g are in the same Archimedean class, it will turn out that there is a constant term and the coefficient of the constant term, I mean, the constant term, and namely the coefficient of the monomial one, is exactly the limit, right? Uh, and, and so we can uh, prove uh, this theorem. This is our main uh, result, which is exactly the generalization of uh, Van den Dries and uh, Levitt's result, but uh, beyond uh, 2 to the 2 to the x. So we can prove it for the whole class of Skolem functions. So, uh, Sorry, so comparable is just the same Archimedean class, or is it same different? Archimedean right? class, same Archimedean class, yes. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, so now we can just extend the same result uh, that we have seen before uh, for the, all the scoring functions. So if we fix G, scoring function, and we let F vary, the set of possible limits is a discrete subset of the reals, so in particular as order type omega. So that means that uh, uh, the set of scalene functions lying in a single comparability class or in a single Archimedean class as order type omega. And this can be the base. In, in the case of Van den Dries and Levitz, this was the base of uh, a complicated induction, uh, which eventually led to the computation of the order type of the fragment. We didn't succeed really in using this to solve a, a scalene problem. We are, but, but there is still a lot of room to proceed. We are just, uh, uh, we're considering this a very important step, but uh, 
we are uh, we are stuck in some other uh, uh, problem that uh, I can. Um, but it's not a substantial problem. It's just a problem of computation. We are not uh, fully able to do some uh, some of these computations. So let's go back again to the example we have seen uh, before. You have uh, two to, two, two, three functions, 2 to the x plus 1, 2 to the x, 2 to the x. You want to, to compute uh, the limit. Uh, you, you, you have f divided by g. You want to compute the limit of f to the 2 to the x divided by g to the 2 to the x. Well, of course, you can do it by hands in this particular case. F raised to the 2 to the x is outside of the, uh, it's outside of the fragment considered by Van den Dries and Levitz. But, it's, uh, but we can apply our uh, uh, procedure, our method. So you start by expanding, considering the surreal expansion of F divided by G. So you plug omega. You get 2 to the omega plus 1 divided by 2 to the omega. This is just 1 plus 1 over 2 to the omega. 1 over 2 to the omega is a monomial, so this is already in normal form. But we have not lost any information. So f divided by g is exactly 1 plus 1 over 2 to the omega. We don't lose any information with these asymptotic expansions. Usually when you do asymptotics, you lose information. Instead, with this kind of Real, so real, so you can do something which is called a super exact asymptotic. So you can really identify the function with its expansion, although there is no claim of convergence of the expansion. It's formal, but it's exact because it's a real equality inside the serial numbers. So once you once you have f over g, you can raise everything to the power 2 to the x, and you get the expansion of the other guy. So 1 plus of 1 over 2 to the omega raised to the power 2 to the omega is e minus some extra terms. And you can compute, uh, you, can, uh, you can compute a few terms if you, if you want. And, and so the limit is therefore e, right? So this is the, the method that you can compute this. We can compute these limits just by doing uh, surreal expansions. Of course, I'm a bit cheating. You need to do some complicated induction hypothesis to prove the, the, this discreteness uh, uh, phenomenon on the limits, because the induction hypothesis must be must, much stronger. No, you cannot simply take the proofs are by induction on the formation of scolem functions. But as the induction hypothesis, you cannot really take the fact that uh, the limits are discrete. You need something much stronger, which involves the structure of the whole expansion, not only the constant term. And this is why it works. Because in this language, we have the correct tool to do the correct asymptotic uh, hypothesis, the, the, the correct inductive hypothesis. But this is the key algebraic part. The rest is a, the complication of the induction. There is a very complicated induction, but in terms of algebra, this is really what's going on. So uh, then, uh, as I said, uh, this is not uh, yet uh, enough to solve Scolem's problem, but we can go a bit farther than uh, the fragment 2 to the 2 to the x, which so far was an obstacle, almost an unsurpassable obstacle. For instance, 2 to the 3 to the x is not a big deal, going 2 to the, two to the 3 to the x rather than 2 to the 2 to the x. But at least we are outside of that fragment. And we get omega to the omega to the omega to the omega as an upper bound, but it's not precise. It's not a precise bound. You, you can also go to 2 to the 4 to the x. You also get similar bounds. And we can arrive to 2 to the x to the x. We can also go farther on, but still we don't get... Uh, uh, but already when we go... When already at st already 2 to the 2 to the x, 2 to the x to the x gives us epsilon 0. But of course, we don't expect that it's optimal. Actually, we expect that uh, it should be 
actually we expect that the optimal bound should be something like, uh, for instance, for two to the two to the two to the, two to the three to the x, we expect that should be something like omega to the omega to the omega square, instead of omega to the omega to the omega to the omega. But anyway, this is just a demonstration of the fact that the surreal numbers can really be used to do real asymptotic expansions on real functions. This is what's the point I wanted to make, uh, which is, as far as you know, the first, uh, uh, can you, the first paper on this line of, uh, of, of, uh, of research. No? Take the surreals seriously. There, it was a dream that this could be done. No? People had spoken about the surreals as a possible dream for a super exact asymptotic, but this is really, uh, uh, can really be done. So let me just uh, change argument. Let's mention also some work that I did with Mantova. Just, this is just the last slide. In Mantova, in uh, the two, two papers, we showed that uh, the, the trans series, you don't know what they are, uh, maybe, but they are contained in the surreals. Of course, the Taylor series are contained in the surreals. You take a Taylor series, you plug uh, instead of x omega, and you get a surreal. But the trans series are much more complicated. Also, those are contained in the surreals. What is more importantly, you know, in my work with Mantova, is that we managed to define a notion of derivation and integral in the sense of antiderivative of a surreal number. So you can take the derivative of omega, which not surprisingly is one, because omega is, you can think of it as plays the role of the formal variable x, of a formal variable x tending to infinity. But you can take also the derivative of uh, the ordinal omega one, no? which is much more complicated to understand what it is. And the, the formula is explicit, but I'm not, I'm not going to give it to you. It's uh, quite sort of complicated, but completely explicit. So you can take the derivative of, a, of an ordinal or, 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 or a surreal number. And you can take, uh, and you can prove that the derivative is surjective so there is an antiderivative, so there is an integral. For instance, you can take the integral of uh, e to the minus omega divided by omega, and, and this is what you get, right? And you get this kind of series. If you think of it as a series in x, it's divergent, but it's still a nice series, which has been used in the past, uh, for instance, by Euler. Um, so you can do real computations you uh, asymptotic computations and uh, uh, and so now this is just the advertisement uh, so uh, this is the situation you have power series in omega in contained in the Laurent series containing the Puiseux series containing the trans series containing the serial numbers but the serial numbers are the best of all so if, if you think of this as cars and you have several features, if they have a radio, if they have air conditioning, and so and so, the surreals have all the positive feature. You can, uh, you, it's a field, it's a, it has a derivation, it has integrals, it has an X and a log, and uh, also the trans series actually have most of these features. But the trans series do not, the, the, the they have also some notion of infinite sum, but it's a kind of restricted. So you cannot take, for instance, uh, for instance, if you take uh, omega plus log omega plus log of log omega plus log 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 omega plus log 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 omega, and you keep going, this is a perfectly legitimate surreal, but it's not a trans series. In a trans series, you have some limitations on the amount of nesting of logs and exp. In the surreals, you have no limitations whatsoever. You can write any kind of series that you want, provided the monomials decrease. Uh, uh, and so you get the best of all worlds in some sense, and you, have, uh, you can take exp, log. So for instance, if you just take the um, power series, you don't have... Uh, if you have Laurent series, you don't have uh, uh, integrals. 
because the integral of 1 over uh, x, 1 over omega, the integral of 1 over omega is log omega, is not a Lorentz series. In the Lorentz series, you have only, uh, you know, uh, powers of x and uh, positive or negative powers of, of x. And uh, so from the work of uh, Aschenbrenner, Van den Dries, and Van der Oven, uh, did a lot of work on the transirius. In particular, they showed that the transirius are a kind of universal domain for the formal solution of differential equations of non-oscillatory nature like log and exp, but not sine and cosine are not good for the surreals. You can define sine and cosine on the, in, on the surreal interval 0, 1, or even uh, minus 10, 10, but not globally. But exp and log can be defined lo globally because they, are non, uh, they do not oscillate. Functions, also arctangent, can be probably defined globally. So things which do not oscillate in a precise sense more likely can be defined in the surreals. But of course, sine and cosine cannot be defined, and it's quite intuitive because you cannot. Because what should be sine of uh, an infinite element? Should be a random number between 0 and 1. So you must, uh, you, you must have uh, the action of choice to decide which one. There is no particular reason to choose one value or another for sine of omega, right? While for sine of one over omega, you can use the Taylor series and you get something very precise. Uh, so the, this is a kind of universal domain in the sense that you can solve uh, lots of differential equations. So, so if you take, for instance, a polynomial over the surreal numbers, you can solve the differential equations, the derivative of f equal pi p of f, right? And, uh, and uh, the, the, that's it. Because the same thing happens in the trans series. And what the Vashen Brander, Van der Driessen, and Van der Oven showed is that actually the surreal numbers with the derivation uh, that we introduced with Mantova is elementary equivalent to the trans series. Actually, the trans series with their derivation are an elementary substructure of the serial numbers in the language with the plus times and derivation. But it's still not, it's still open whether this can be extended to the language with plus times exp and derivation. So the serial numbers are an elementary, elementary superstructure of the trans series, both in the language with the exp and in the language with the derivation, but it's not known whether it's with, if you put both x and the derivation, the conjecture is that it still works, but nobody uh, uh, nobody knows it yet. There was uh, 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 there are people working on it, but it is still uh, work in in progress, and it's probably a difficult problem. So let's see what else I need to say. Ah, yes, I need to say this: that this derivation that I just mentioned behaves well with respect to the expansion of Skolem uh, functions. So if you take a Skolem function, or more generally, an expansion, if you take a function uh, defined using x times uh, x and so on, like a Skolem function, if you, if you take the surreal expansion and then you take the derivation of the surreal expansion, you get the same result that taking the function, take the analytic derivative of the function and then expand it again. So the derivation, I mean, it's a real derivation which commutes well with the, the, the derivation of the functions. Although these ex surreal expansions are not converging. I mean, maybe they are converging, but we don't care. They are only formal. So that's it. So I, just uh, this is what I wanted to say. No. Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, let's uh, let's all thank uh, Alessandro. And uh, is there is there any are there any questions about uh, about the talk? I have I have I have a, a couple of questions actually. Yes. Um, 
So um, th 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 there's something I'm maybe maybe you said it, but I'm I'm sort of unclear about it. Um, yeah, so in your surreal expansion, you you it's like you replace x by omega, right? Is this choice canonical in some sense, or can you choose any? Could you choose omega one or? A good question. Uh, you cannot choose uh, an arbitrary infinite element. Uh, you have to choose something which is called log atomic element. Log atomic elements are this are those elements, infinite elements, such that which are monomials, but and all the all the iterated logs are monomials. So you can choose omega because log omega, log of log omega, log of log of log omega are all monomials. Mm -hmm. But if you, you, if you choose uh, your omega plus one, uh, it's a bit more messy because uh, if you do log of omega plus one, uh, it's not a monomial, it has an expansion. So in some sense, these log atomic elements really behave as variables. Mm. So you can you you need to choose something which behaves as a variable which has no structure whatsoever, because if you keep taking logs, you are always a monomial. Yeah, very very good question. Thanks. So the, otherwise, uh, well, omega one will probably uh, work, but uh, um, not uh, not not. I mean, it's important to choose a log atomic element to make things work nicely. So you get an iso. If you choose a log atomic element and you take everything which can be generated using infinite sums, exp and log, you get something which contains the transeries under the natural embedding, which sends the variable to the log atomic element. But just to just to get a feeling, like uh, I suppose, without just like uh, without knowing, but like I suppose that omega to the omega is not log uh, atomic, but is is uh, epsilon zero log atomic or? Okay, omega to the omega is ambiguous because what do you mean by omega to the omega? Omega to the it can mean two things. It can mean the ordinal omega to the omega, or it could be, or or it could be, um, no, e meant... to the omega log omega. Oh no, I meant I meant e to the omega log omega, but uh, uh, okay. e to the omega log omega. Uh, this should be uh, log atomic, right? Yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, omega is a monomial. Log omega is a monomial. The product of two monomials is a monomial. So omega times log omega is a monomial, and it's infinite. So it's purely infinite. And E sends purely infinite two monomials. So E to so it is a monomial. Oh, okay. But of course, the disadvantage, the problem with that. Okay. Now the bad thing, the bad news, but it's unavoidable, is that omega to the omega as an ordinal, I mean, ordinal exponentiation doesn't coincide with surreal exponentiation restricted to the ordinals, mm. right? Because omega to the omega, as uh, if you do ordinal exponentiation, it's an ordinal. If you do surreal exponentiation, it's something else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Are there any other questions? Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Hi. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, at some point, Luca asked you, um, and you said, oh, and there was a typo in the, in the slide, that essentially you were doing these, uh, you, you were computing these surreal numbers, but not through all ordinals, but stopping at omega one. Uh, what are the indexes? Uh, gamma, as I said, if you stop at gamma, you get a nice uh, a model of TX epsilon zero. Epsilon epsilon. zero. Uh -huh. So, so you need something that's closed under exponentiation, essentially. Exactly, and this is another indication that maybe scaling problem is true. I mean, uh, the, the scaling conjecture is true. You can embed the scaling functions into the surreals. Mm -hmm. bounded by epsilon zero in the tree. And mm -hmm. also when you do this a serious expansion, the index is always less than epsilon zero. So this column functions in some sense live inside epsilon zero, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's still uh, not enough because 
because the real numbers live at level omega but inside the real numbers you can embed any ordinal right okay any countable ordinal mm. but so you we need to understand the, in a better way the possible uh, support of uh, the scaling mm -hmm. functions when we expand uh, it in uh, in, uh, in a series the result that we have uh, about this discreteness result I say that uh, essentially another way of stating uh, the discreteness result is that uh, uh, the coefficients of the Skolem terms range in a discrete set provided you fix the previous ones. At least as long as you are not uh, at a limit stage. The limit stage is still uh, to be understood better because what we can prove is we can prove this that uh, if you take any monomial appearing in the support of a scoring function in the serial expansion the first uh, monomials are uh, clear what they are the first possible monomial so let me say it again take f divided by g two scoring functions and try to expand it Suppose they are in the first in the same Archimedean class. So the first monomial is one because they are in the same Archimedean class. So it could be a real times one. The second monomial is necessarily one over omega, maybe with a coefficient zero, but cannot be one over square root of omega. So the next monomial is necessarily one over omega, then one over omega squared. So like a Laurent series. It's still not completely clear what could be the monomial in omega position. So at limit stage, we are not good control on the support. If we get a, met a better control on the support, we have a good control on the coefficients once we know the support, but we don't have a good control on the support. Remember that the, 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 the monomials appearing in the support, every monomial, can be written in exponential notation. Every monomial is e to something purely infinite. So to understand the possible monomials that can appear, we must go up one level and understand the, the coefficients of uh, appearing, you know, at a higher level. In some sense, uh, like the Cantor normal form of ordinals. So it, it, it is. Uh, it has several levels, right? Omega to the omega to the omega to the omega. So even here, we understand very well what happens on the ground level. We don't understand very well what happens at the next level. Because to understand what happens at the next level, we should take the log of our object. Because at, 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 at level two, there are the same things which are at level one once, once you take the log. Unfortunately, the scoring functions are not closed under log. So we cannot do induction on the formation of scoring functions, but they are not closed under log. You may close them under log, but then it becomes more complicated. So essentially, we understand very well the ground level, but not the successive, the, the other levels. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I have a, a silly question and a possibly sillier or less silly question. Um, yes. So can, can you back, go back to the slide with the main theorem? Um, where is it? Just a moment. Um, if it's working otherwise, I can just ask. It's this one, this one, right? Uh, I only see a black screen, but no, but anyway, the question was, so you, at some point you said, okay, we get that this set is discrete and it's also closed. So yes. So order the Why is it closed again? Is it, is it easy or? No, 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 no. I mean, it's, uh, uh, well, let me think. Uh, let me think. Uh, no, 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 no. 
No, we prove that it's a discrete uh, and, 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 and close at the same time. What we really prove is that uh, if you fix a real number, the set of uh, possible limits below that real, that particular real number is a finite set. Okay, I see. This is what we prove. Okay. And then the other question is, I mean, th this is more like, naive, just... Um, Right, so can you define, um, so okay, so you have a derivation on, on those real numbers. Can you do a relative, do you have like, a, for example, a generic homomorphism as, a, as an ordered abelian group you can define or have you so, Sorry, I haven't understood. Uh, we have a derivation and? So because a, a, a related context sometimes when people look at derivations, sometimes they also look at the generic homomorphisms. Uh, there's this delta becoming sigma, etc. So, I mean, it, it, it's a naive question. Like, it's, so the question is: Is there some natural generic homomorphism of the uh, numbers as ordered groups? Say, well, first of all, if it's generic, I don't like it. <laughs> everything, okay. everything in the surreals must be explicit, and you can you you must write down formulas. You don't want the action of choice. You want really to write down things. Yeah, yeah, so the question, with generic, I mean something like, for example, is not always sigma of x greater than x, right? Or yeah, okay. Well, uh, uh, the problem the problem is that, uh, I, I don't know, the honest answer is that I don't know. Uh, but I can say something about automorphisms. The problem is that, uh, one problem is that I don't know if there are automorphisms at all. In, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, um, non-trivial automorphisms preserving all the structures, all the structure, preserving x, log, field, and also infinite sums. So I don't know if there are automorphisms preserving all the structure. Could be rigid, maybe okay. not. No, actually, probably is not. But the possible automorphisms are maybe quite complicated, if there are. Okay, but for example, there's no known automorphism described, you know, ex explicitly described, uh, explicitly describable, as you were saying before, or? Uh, no, 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 I, I forget about explicitly describable. I, I just don't know if there are automorphisms. Any, any, okay, okay, I see. If you, if you uh, of, of course, if you don't insist that it preserves infinite sums, there are, but... Yeah, uh, but if you want them to preserve infinite sums, I don't know if there are. Okay, thanks. Uh, may maybe yes, uh, but uh, making some strange uh, permutations with uh, log atomic numbers, but uh, I, I don't know. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right. <clears throat> are there any any more questions for Alessandro? Well, if not, then uh, let's uh, thank him again and uh, for the very nice talk. And uh, we meet again uh, next week. The um, speaker will be Alejandro Poveda, and he will talk about forcing iterations around singular cardinals and an application to stationary ref reflection. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandro. Goodbye. Okay, thank you. So this is an errata coverage to my uh, previous talk. And uh, I realized that uh, I didn't answer correctly to Raphael's question uh, regarding whether uh, omega to the omega is log atomic. Um, as I said, so omega to the omega is ambiguous. It can be meant as the ordinal omega to the omega, so ordinal exponentiation, or it could be meant as exp of uh, omega times log omega. So this is the, uh, in this second sense, I, I don't know about the, the first one, but in this second sense, e to the omega log omega, this is indeed not log atomic. And this is easy to uh, see. Uh, a log atomic element is an element such that all the iterated logs are uh, monomials. And this is obviously not, because if you take a first logarithm, you get omega times log omega. If you take a second logarithm, the logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms, so you get log omega plus log of log omega. And, and this is the sum of two monomials, so it's a binomial, it's not a monomial. So this is, this is the, um, 
the, 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 the answer, the correct answer. So in order to do things work properly, um, the role of the variables should be taken by a logatonic element. So omega is fine, omega to the omega is not. It doesn't behave like a variable because if you take the log twice, you get a binomial. This is not something that you want from a variable uh, behavior. So this is it. This is all, everything I wanted to add. Thank you again. Thank you to Luca for allowing uh, an errata coverage to a video conference. So this is quite unusual, but uh, it's, uh, it's good that, that uh, it can be done. Okay, thank you.